четыре. Yeah, thank you, Sian, and thank you, everyone, uh, uh, for uh, the Epescons. I mean, not only this edition. I was here, we can't recall exactly, but when was the, the year of release of Free Beer, the book? 2008. 2008. So I was here in 2008 with an amazing bus trip that I took at that time, keeping it low budget. And, and uh, 2010, I gave this presentation. And I like to show it because it's, although it's six years ago, what I'm going to show you is uh, uh, pretty much uh, an application of the principles that I uh, came to share six years ago when I presented you the research, uh, um, the sort of uh, provocation, the, the metaphor, the, the, the self-provocation also as a programmer that um, uh, I got inspired together with my partner. Uh, who is a permaculture expert, Deborah Solomon. And I presented this sort of uh, inspiration as a design pattern for software. So the underlying principles for uh, design patterns uh, uh, in, in permaculture are really interesting. They are about diversity. Uh, they are about, uh, uh, or oh, perhaps I'm annoying you by moving a lot around. I don't know if you can, yeah, no, it's good. Thanks for the man behind the camera. Very great. Um, uh, so basically, we, I reasoned and I presented you, uh, this is a slide in Italian, it's not actually a slide, it's someone that was in, the, in, the, in one of the workshops and draw a little bit the principles, it's in Italian, the workshop was in south of Italy. The principles are um, speaking a lot about why uh, monocultural in agriculture, for instance, is really wrong on a scale that is beyond the production level, beyond actually having efficiency. It's, it's uh, not resilient. In a way, resiliency is a concept that goes around a lot nowadays uh, as a design principle as well. And it speaks a lot about uh, the vulnerability of a system that puts all, let's say, its eggs in one basket or uh, aims at going only in one direction or basically unifies and uniforms everything into one single uh, project or attempt to succeed. So I'm here to present you something extremely uh, concrete that stormed, uh, that speaks about uh, 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 almost a tragedy of the commons that stormed uh, all sorts of uh, fora uh, online and offline for about uh, four years. And uh, that was the, the fork of Debian that we declare after the GR uh, resolution in 2000. Uh, 14. The GR resolution was about the switch uh, to system D in the init, uh, but it wasn't exactly about that. It was proposed by Jan Jackson as a resolution that would say that there is no way to actually recommend an init system, a single init system in a package. So it should be open. So I will go in detail into that and why that was uh, an actual uh, case for a, a fork to happen, for an actual exodus of developers and users to happen from Debian, and uh, to create what we call now init freedom. Uh, it's, uh, it's a sort of uh, provocation because it's not exactly about the free software uh, character of the init system, but it's about the fact that uh, we want to be free to run any software after the init even if that is not the init system itself. So the sort of architectural pattern that systemd proposes is an entangling one. Once you boot from it from the init, or once something like KDBus is accepted into the Linux kernel, then we are entangled into it up to the application space. And that is a very dangerous situation, because you can't get out of that sort of compatibility restriction. You lose one dimension that we always had in free software is the interoperability that came from inheriting the values of the Unix principles. So basically, what we claim is not that system D shouldn't be around. We claim that people should be free to choose parts of it or parts of, uh, of different operating systems or different packets to work together and that uh, uh, we can't go on with this sort of arrogance that one 
a single system doesn't have to respect anything that existed before it. It's this sort of uh, arrogance that makes change the ground under everyone's feet. And this is not only an activist stance, actually. Uh, many people that did not thought we were just trolling the situation, and seriously we weren't uh, when we were uh, discussing and debating this through the years, uh, many people understood uh, that for their own companies and uh, also for institutions in public sector, it was of vital importance to keep legacy systems working and to go at a pace that is sustainable, especially for what it means to re uh, retrain all the co-workers and reinstall all the machines with the new system. So this was the, the general resolution vote and I'm going into some detail because uh, fundamentally Dev1 is not uh, just a fork of Debian but it's the declaration that we do not trust anymore Debian as a system to conduct uh, a faithful mission abiding to its own contract. The social contract of Debian was fundamentally violated. And um, some see this as the tip of an iceberg, some see this as a new thing coming, but basically uh, there was a larger group of people that wanted to mark the, the point and to say, okay, we are going to distanciate ourselves from further governance within Debian and go on with our own path. This was also a decision that uh, caused uh, much less pain in everyone because uh, those who weren't trolling the situation understood that uh, building a different path, even from the mainstream decision, was actually useful to Debian itself. And we contributed back to Debian several patches uh, by now, uh, especially on the CI. And, uh, well, the lack of trust uh, is well summed up by this. Uh, sort of scheme that was posted by Design. Design is an historical forum moderator of Debian uh, that resigned uh, after many aggressions uh, over any discussion that could happen about System D and posted this sort of uh, summary, highlighting that the option four, which uh, won the voting according to the Schultz model of calculation for the vote, um, is the actual one that was less talking about the problem. The solution that vote was like, is not required a solution. So we don't want to talk about this. Now what the design highlights is that uh, this sort of vote came after at least two years of uh, inflammatory campaigns, uh, which we can well imagine if we think about the past campaigns uh, in the US elections. Uh, in which people definitely insulted and aggressed each other from both camps, from the pro and the anti system D camps. Now, um, if you ask people that have an actual uh, interest into the project and they, are, they don't want to be bothered about trolling, what do they think after two years of this sort of uh, internal split? They will definitely tell you, like, give me a break, I don't want to talk about it. And um, this was the first vote that won. But uh, the second vote that won was the actual proposition that uh, uh, support for other init system is recommended but not mandatory, which is a softened position of what Ian Jackson proposed, and uh, it's actually uh, something that would uh, still uh, be uh, respecting everyone's position into this diatribe, so not put in the hands of every single package maintainer, so the sort of infiltration as we see it that has been happening in Debian, uh, the power to actually lock the system by saying this actual init system is mandatory. Um, the calculation is, uh, it can be done in uh, very different ways. Uh, this is not claiming that it was another, the winning solution, but if we exclude the four and five, which is a sort of uh, accessory position that one says, I don't want to talk about this, and the other, the other says, let's talk about this some more. So it's like people that are confused about the sort of decision that needs to be taken. If we take the first three, which say must not, shall not, and may, then uh, definitely we see that the grand total is may, shall not, must not. So this sort of uh, GR resolution came with a lot of pain. After this, several Debian developers 
uh, that were crucial actually to the system resigned, uh, Roger Lake, uh, Jan Jackson himself, and uh, basically it was quite a loss for the community. So what came after was the attempt to make it uh, better for everyone, and we think that with that one we also chipped in uh, by simply, sim simply um, admitting the fact that the city, the citadel was taken, and going out on a nearby hill, light up a fire and welcome everyone that was walking out of the citadel, saying, okay, this is the campfire, uh, and we are going to build something new now. And we did it with uh, uh, several people that actually used Debian in production, my own organization and others, and rely on it for mission critical uh, or actual uh, use. We did it with the enthusiasm of people that wanted to actually modernize the infrastructure behind the Debian, wanted to reduce the documentation to the point and to actually actualize it also for newcomers and really bring it to a point in which it can actually be understood. So the first thing that we really concentrated our efforts is obviously the continuous integration system. What we envision is, of course, not that of rebuilding all the packages of Debian, but uh, uh, that of forking the packages that we needed to fork. And uh, we did so by cloning from Aliot, the Git repository in Debian, into a GitLab installation, our own Git repository, which is pretty modern and usable. Then we proceeded fixing what, is, uh, what was actually bugged, the Debian uh, Jenkins glue, and uh, connected it to the Git to actually have Jenkins arms instead of uh, BDD in this case. Uh, we are still contemplating uh, to, to put together also BDD. Uh, but Jenkins has some advantages, especially for uh, uh, reproducible builds. We actually uh, trigger a Jenkins build out of issues on GitLab which is also pretty handy. So you can have your repository uh, enabled and you just open an issue build and uh, you write inside, you know, unstable testing or stable and it actually Jenkins takes it and builds it for uh, all the target platforms. In Jenkins, we implemented the most of the target platforms that are in Debian, especially the ARM and MIPS one. And we did so also by fixing another thing that was broken in QEMU to actually have builds in QEMU with a small software called PinThread, uh, Cuemo had uh, uh, several problems in building uh, actual cross-platform uh, packages on multi-threaded systems. So you have to pin the thread of Cuemo building to a single thread. Jenkins then further uh, publishes to Amprolla, which is our uh, new uh, package repository. We did not use Reprepro or, um, or uh, Duck. Uh, we actually wrote Amprolla because, uh, and this was like one of the winning points to actually roll into production what we call a beta right away, because Amprolla actually has the um, uh, capability to redirect all the requests on the Debian repositories. So we basically overlay our package builds, and uh, when you try to download a package that we haven't forked, you will be redirected to Debian. And uh, there is more complexity because actually we also overlay security, backports, and, uh, uh, and so on. And uh, we are developing now the second version of this software in which we can actually control if a new packet that came out from these overlays introduces a new dependency to system D for the review and so on and so forth. So far, we are uh, in beta, still we call it beta, but we manage to keep up with the pace of security updates in Debian. So for instance, the last uh, cow uh, uh, bug, we were fixing it, we were shipping a fix basically in uh, zero time with this approach. So we are uh, two years old now. We started, if you remember, uh, it was November also when the GR uh, uh, resolution was, uh, was getting out. And as of today, that's what we count on our infrastructure. We have a very active community uh, with uh, about uh, uh, 200 people on the IRC like channels that grew Im immensely. We had a lot of uh, uh, press coverage um, and even the people that actually called us troll, they were just like making us more visible. So it, it was like a sort of snowball. 
and uh, this event of, uh, of uh, the, the Jesse release in Debian adopting system D and the GR solution was extremely visible among the communities. So we got a lot of uh, uh, response. Uh, we got contacted by Open Nebula, which is a pretty minimal system to actually run your own uh, virtual machines. And we are already in their market, so you can click and install that one. And for the rest, it's uh, fairly simple. I will show you to update to it. We also became a base distribution for several other uh, systems that rolled out uh, from us. This is a, a more or less actualized list. And uh, at Dyn.org, we are switching already all our projects over on this platform. The first one we are rolling out is DAOs, a privacy box for the Internet of Things that runs on embedded devices. And actually, that one really helps. I'll show you also a little bit of numbers on that. Uh, Gnuinos is a very interesting effort uh, that is going into the direction of creating a 100% free uh, Libre distribution that is approved by the FSF. And actually, there is a lot of leverage there also if you think that hard has been completely ruled out by the update in Debian. Uh, also, people that were doing like the, the BSD uh, fork in Debian, they were completely rolled out all their efforts. To not even mention UC libc and uh, Musl libc, which are completely ruled out. So diversity uh, is a very important thing for us. There were like several projects that were either rewriting the libc for embedded systems, either putting hard a different kernel on the Debian use base, and they were completely wiped out by the arrogance of the uh, way system D was proposed and said to be the system of the future for GNU Linux distributions. This is, uh, we believe, not the case. Diversity is going to survive, although we are marginal. And uh, I think we are out of the zone in which we can be derided. Uh, we can be uh, just called trolls. Um, the most productive um, actual uh, shift was that of Refracta which is uh, an amazing distribution, uh, mostly consisting of a script that reproduces itself. It's what I would call a nomadic distribution. So basically, if you install a refractor, you can also uh, modify the live CD. And then uh, with a command, you can freeze it in a new live CD. So you can basically install a system, install the things that you like, remove the things that you don't like, customize everything uh, from the desktop to the system, and then with a command, freeze it in a new live CD, which is exactly what you received, which is something that someone can install and recustomize. Uh, and it's easy. So this actually, it's really like uh, uh, the principles of free software at work, I would say. And uh, by um, Refracta had to move immediately. F.S. Mitred, the developer of Refracta, was investigating uh, uh, what happened with the system D. He had some uh, uh, minor problems, but most of all, he was very mistreated, along with a, a large number of people in Debian, by the people that either uh, were not affected or were actually uh, trolling. So out of Refracta came, uh, for instance, Mio, which is a distribution that is a, a respin of it, just recently reviewed by uh, some uh, YouTube uh, uh, celebrities. And uh, Dynabolic, also under free uh, distribution, the number four will actually run on uh, dev one. As well, we are planning uh, the heads distribution, which, as you can imagine from the name, is the opposite of tails since we believe that uh, system D actually introduces a huge surface of attack. And uh, many security experts are actually agreeing with me by actually introducing very new code and uh, actually having a lot of binary dependencies between vital parts that are running in the system, then uh, we uh, do not uh, trust any more tails since it came out with a new release that actually adopts all the system without even a critical stance on it. So we are going to roll out heads, and we have some uh, new, also, innovations that we plan to put in there. Our favorite right now is uh, what uh, worked out Catalats. Catalats is one of the, um, uh, I would say, senior members uh, by now. I don't say old, but senior, uh, definitely, of the Freaknet. And um, he released this distribution, the Minimal Live, which uh, 
uh, carries the name of a, of a, of a beloved, uh, unfortunately disappeared member of the Freaknet, Otello, Otello Urso, who was, uh, uh, among other qualities, he has that, that he didn't use his eyes to look at things. He used many other senses. And um, basically, we managed to pack together a distribution that uh, runs in 74 megabytes of RAM on an AMD 64. It all goes even like below 64 megabytes of RAM uh, on a 386. It has the full packages available for Debian installable, which is uh, a big quality if you consider Alpine Linux and other minimal distros. And uh, actually, uh, we managed to put inside the support for um, blind people by collaborating with the Linux Speakup org community, which was left completely behind because the uh, huge changes, again, that SystemD introduced uh, so um, irresponsibly basically ruled out uh, also those people. And uh, while they are technically well-skilled, they are also very slow in catching up because you can imagine programming with the aid of sound, it gets much slower. Uh, so we actually managed to keep involved all this community and not make it uh, fall apart just out of this change. Here you see also a little choice that we made uh, for those of you that like to do distributions. We think that this is a new set of, let's say, very minimal tools that you want to have in your system when it doesn't even have X and that you want to be able to use right away. Uh, these uh, tools, not all of them, but most of them, we think of uh, rolling them out also in new versions of Dev1 in the future as the actual uh, minimal installation of Dev1. So we took a lot of uh, little, um, let's say, stones out of uh, um, our uh, shoes, <laughs> who were uh, full of stones, we realized. For instance, taking out very unusable things like Xim4 that gets constantly installed when you install Debian and then uh, putting in some other things that you obviously want to have in your system. The package repositories. Um, we uh, rolled out, uh, even before Debian, uh, the availability of our package repositories over the Tor network. And uh, we have like these three uh, package repositories which we uh, recommend to install. And basically, there is also a fourth one, which is backports, which is also mirroring Debian backports and where already you have available a kernel 4 version with GRSEC patches, which are desirable. So basically, for a very simple migration, everything you have to do is to substitute, and not add, but substitute the repositories with this uh, set. These uh, repositories will actually overlay the Debian ones. And uh, to uh, inherit the trust, uh, as I said, the Git a repository that we have has documented every single change we do to every single package, which is actually tagged with the package version plus dev1. So our fork, unlikely Ubuntu's fork, is definitely backward compatible to Debian. You can switch also back and forth. And we don't plan actually to break compatibility between packages as Ubuntu did. So we, are, we have also by now the ambition of doing a fork and doing, doing it well. Um, this is the procedure to actually uh, update something like a Wheezy or a Jesse today. It's uh, very straightforward. You just uh, update the sources list, uh, make an update, install our keyring, then dist upgrade, which will do most of the work. Then you make sure that uh, you install sysv Linux. Then you reboot. At the reboot, the machine will come uh, back, and it did in all cases so far, and then uh, remove systemd. And then the removal of systemd will be possible. If you don't, uh, for those that are new to this diatribe, if you don't change the init system, then um, it's not possible. What we did behind the, 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 the scene in the back, stage, let's say, is removing a lot of the dependencies that entangle systemd in all packages. So this is about uh, 160 packages that got uh, changed. Uh, they mostly changed the dependencies. And uh, basically, this means that um, you have uh, the Jesse as if it would be 
without just that. And we kept faith to the first promise, which was very important for the world community, to not change anything else. We are contemplating other changes in our testing, which is ASCII. We are naming uh, our releases after planet names. So Jesse is actually a planet name, luckily for us. And the next one is ASCII. And the testing is planet number one, Ceres. One thing that we are doing uh, uh, to modernize this whole system with our CI is also provide native targets to the most used devices. So we are actually changing the way uh, the targets are perceived in Debian and they are distributed. We are actually packing uh, a ready to flash on a SD card image that, is, uh, that doesn't need to be uh, packed by third parties, but we are uh, basically integrating it into our CI. Um, we manage to uh, basically produce all these targets into one run of a script that uh, takes the packages and compiles and also apply the patches. As I said, we have Open Nebula and also the, the, the cloud image and uh, that is for OpenStack, and then uh, Vagrant boxes, which are very, very useful. So a lot of us are working uh, um, on uh, GNU Linux in a terminal, but we don't leave behind the desktop, as you can see. Uh, yet there is a lot of work going on in the back end, especially for embedded. A note, an interesting note, a lot of the people that were left out by the, uh, by the narrative and the plan of system D were uh, people working with embedded devices. Also because we want to be able to customize these systems eventually to use Musil libc to compile more static binaries and to use UC libc. Behind the scene, there is this SDK on which we are working on, which is a new, uh, a new run at the, the documentation of the whole system which is basically consisting of several parts, which we are rationalizing. And these parts uh, uh, handle all stages from the bootstrap, which we also had to fork. And we even, uh, we even fixed the Debian bootstrap with patches that were never accepted upstream. Um, from the bootstrap to the blends, which we call blends as the set of packages that you build into your own distribution to the final delivery, either in a virtual machine or in a live system or in an ARM box. And we are uh, sharing all the common functions into libdev1 SDK. We are writing this in ZSH, which is a shell system which is much more friendly for programmers uh, than uh, Bash, and uh, basically uh, organizing it into three stages. We are writing the whole uh, documentation for this process to substitute most of the uh, by now very fragmentary documentation that uh, uh, stands behind uh, um, Debian. Uh, the system dev1, you can address it with uh, uh, just dev-1, uh, so it's pronounced exactly as it sounds. Uh, dev1, if you go dev-1, either number, either one, dot org, you will be redirected to our website, which is then written in a, in a funky way with uh, the VUA in between. The VUA stands for Veteran Unix Admins, which was the anonymous name that many of us took at the moment of this uh, uh, complete diatribe to not be uh, too much exposed. Uh, into it uh, with our own names. Some of us then came forward, many are still behind. We have a, a board of trustees, which is overviewing of what we do, on which there are like no names in Europe for, uh, for the sort of integrity we are looking for. And uh, these are more or less numbers. So uh, the mailing list uh, uh, is now uh, mostly troll free. And it's, uh, uh, I, I would say since quite long time, it's a very pleasant place. A lot of good writers actually moved on the mailing list. And we are uh, also running uh, Talk Devon Org, which is a community documentation effort on Discuss, which is pretty accessible, actually. Um, we are getting uh, donations, in general, uh, pretty many uh, for, for such a project. We are not a bombastic Kickstarter. We didn't produce any mar marketing so far. We just had voluntary coverage from journalists and we did not do a campaign for donations uh, beyond just putting a link and a possibility to give donations. 
yet in about two years uh, we receive uh, up to 10,000 euros of donations from people that also write us saying thank you, I really need it, and so on and so forth. We went around in conferences uh, to talk also to, to especially in virtualization, enterprise level conferences, and we talk with people from uh, very high institutions that run actual mission critical stuff, they use Open Nebula, and they are contemplating using that one. For instance, the Fermilab in US and other bigger institutions, they are definitely attracted by the fact that we are calling for simplicity. We are not treating our users as guinea pigs with testing new systems, and we are actually wanting to keep the status quo and making sure that any change that is done to the system does not break what people is actually using. So you could call us conservatives in a way, um, I'm not sure I am a conservative through the whole political spectrum, but what we want to have is definitely um, some software conservancy, conservancy in terms of uh, uh, not changing the ground under the feet of people. And uh, this reconducts to the, to the principles uh, really of, of permaculture that I, that I showed at the beginning. Uh, I think that this sort of effort, uh, as peaceful as it's getting, finally, uh, not looking for more publicity uh, against System D, although, as you can hear, I'm opinionated, is looking to build an alternative where people can uh, survive their own way. And uh, we do believe that, and uh, we will continue doing our analysis, uh, that System D is driving uh, a lot of people into places they do not want to go. Uh, but uh, it might also come something interesting out of it. Uh, some of us hope that Debian will come to actual reason one day, but that has to come from a rather uh, vertical leadership that is now encrusting it, and uh, um, perhaps it could revert to something more reasonable as saying, okay, we, we cannot impose uh, an, in, an init system into a package. But right now, uh, the, the, the signals go the other way, actually. More packages are, uh, are converted, and there are a lot of internal conflicts, whether that should be done or not, and how stable the system is becoming. So uh, a last remark, the way and the reason why we actually lost uh, our trust in Debian, it was uh, precisely the way the leadership has handled that vote I started with. I believe that uh, um, it is uh, not actual anarchy as much as many people wish. Uh, Debian has never been really an anarchy. There is no real uh, anarchy package to install. It has a very strong leadership. It is moved by ambition. It's not so diverse, nor in terms of gender or ethnicity. And it has imposed itself with certain rules that uh, were not contemplating the minority. So in the moment in which you have a vote that actually splits your community 50%, the first thing that a good leader should be doing is uh, proposing a mediation. And that is a role of leadership, proposing a mediation that does not actually denigrate the, the different opinion of a, a minority that by, by far is uh, not really a small minority, but trying to keep things together and united. This was definitely not done in Debian. So uh, basically, uh, we are continuing through our path. Uh, there is a lot of happiness around what we are doing so far. Uh, so um, although grief is still there for having lost the basic citadel, I must say the process is pretty happy, is that of building a new system that uh, will diverge more and more from, from Debian. In ASCII, we plan to build more, even more package uh, in our own way. The promise with Jesse was that of just removing that package. And that is already making a lot of people switch. Uh, there is an open process in making a social contract that should be very close to that of Debian, but contemplate also its limits. And uh, you are very welcome with your questions also. Thank you for the opportunity to present that one. This was the first time that one was, pre was presented in an actual free software conference. Thank you. So we have uh, 10 minutes for questions. And I see a <coughs> quick hand here, Thomas. Yeah. Can you tell us about the origin, how you, did, how you um, decided the name Devo, the name origin? It's, it's uh, from the Bua, better than Linux 
So there is an online group, which is a closed group, that came together, it counts about a thousand people, and came together around this uh, article of Paul Venezia that details, uh, it's a decalogue of uh, the uh, veteran Unix admins, cultural traits. Now, not that we agree with all of them, for instance, I'm an Emacs user, but uh, many people, in a way, sort of identify with those sort of uh, uh, traits, and uh, that was the group. And when, and many even developers are also part of that group. And when this diatribe came, that group was a sort of safe camp where to discuss and debate in a serious way about what was happening. And many people have called into that group, or even developers have actually incited this to happen. They said, yeah, we have to go through. So we kept the name of the group into the, the, the actual name. That was a very simple uh, decision. <coughs> Uh, yes. Um. <laughs> Hello. Uh, my question is, how is Debian affected by Debian decisions? Let's say Debian decides to drop an architecture. Does that affect you at all? Uh, no. We plan to steer the decisions. So. Uh, from a governance point of view, we, what we want to have is uh, a hand on the, on the handle uh, of our, I mean, we have our own vehicle. So, as much as Debian deviates from our own vision of how the operating system we do, we will be active uh, to uh, make our system different. So, Debian cannot affect in any way the decisions of D1. That one uh, actually relies on the fact that Debian does not take strong decisions in the future. But if that it does, then we delete it. We do have certain uh, di different views that we want to elaborate, but they are slowly uh, developing in the future. For instance, just to make an example, OpenRC. The way the OpenRC uh, package is done in Debian, which could have been crucial actually to the proposition of keeping another Linux system, is completely wrong. Uh, not only according to me and to us, to our team, but also according to the upstream, which is now Gen2. And uh, it's basically uh, doing something like uh, rewriting all the init scripts. So if you install OpenRC, you have your sysb init uh, completely rewritten, and they conflict with each other. But OpenRC is designed to coexist with another init system, so that you can try it. You could even run some daemons with OpenRC and some other daemons with uh, CSV Linux, because it uses etc conf d. So um, we really like OpenRC. It's also a very good candidate for uh, FreeBSD. So it's a way to actually share uh, a very minimal system of startup with even more systems, and with very skilled developers, as uh, BSD developers are. So we are trying to actually rebuild it completely. Um, we will uh, probably have a, a, our own package of OpenRC in, in that one, because we do not agree with the way the policy of OpenRC was made in Debian. I have Why? one more question. Yeah, OK. You mentioned security issues. Could you please expand on that? Uh, what are the security issues that we have observed in System D? Thank you. Well, I could uh, just uh, reply with the one-liner that came out that actually crashes your system D with one line. It was like an advisory that came out something like uh, a month ago. Uh, so there are many ways to actually crash a system that is so complex. My belief, uh, if I wear the hat of a security researcher, I don't work in the security industry anymore, and I'm very glad of that, uh, is that as you augment the complexity, you have more possibilities for a fault to happen. So let's say you basically enlarge the, the attack surface. This is, I think, a, a general assumption that in my work I apply everywhere. Simplicity is uh, much better for keeping away bugs, basically, and readability. So um, I believe that in this general assumption, system defaults in a completely opposite way. Then they are doing a lot of choices about binary uh, uh, interdependence, and uh, there are uh, huge amounts of lines being written by a, a single team, uh, paid also by a corporation, which is Red Hat. Uh, so uh, 
besides the conspiracy theories which are also there about this, it's a really limited peer review that what they are writing is having. C coders are mainly less than shell, uh, shell programmers, so uh, you have, uh, uh, they lack all the eyes of all the system administrators that are perhaps now old, but still that uh, uh, can tell what is uh, really reliable for a production system and what not. An interesting note about this experience is that our community is definitely a plus 50, plus 60 community. And uh, they uh, denigrate us because of this, saying, yeah, the old farts are going into this like obsolete system. But actually, we uh, really uh, are realizing that this is a big value. We have a high level uh, uh, submissions into our mailing list discussion. People that really know how to relate to each other via email. So a very civilized discussion, very uh, smart and very seasoned uh, sysadmins are contributing to, to the decision and commenting to it. So let's say uh, age, so switching completely to a young group of programmers uh, from one day to the other, let's say in the span of four years, is not always the best move for, uh, for actual mission critical systems. Uh, yes. You initially talk about interoperability, and that's the goal. Do you think you can reach a point where no packages depend on any system and works regardless of what you have? Uh, wasn't already so? Like, can you make me an example of a package that depends from CSD uh, in it? System 5. You mean you want an example of a package that has a dependency on a system? Does most have actual dependency on one system or another? Like, yes. Some packages support system D, some packages support system D, some support only system D, some support only system D, and that circle is always going to yeah, switch between each other. Like, but do you see a way that the opti system can come? But we don't actually need a dependency on it, where it just works regardless of what you have. No, that, that, that we already reached. It was already there. There is no dependency on the init system by software. It's system D that is introducing this dependency, not uh, uh, the status quo, not uh, system 5. Also, it's very interesting to note that before actually coming out with the system D plan, uh, three employees at Red Hat, uh, among them also the, the main author of System D, Leonard Pottery, have filed an actual patent on uh, uh, security protections on a binary API. Now, I don't remember the exact name. So that patent was filed and it's containing actual uh, a design. Uh, luckily enough, patents, software patents are not uh, valid in Europe, but if they would be, we would be also constrained that uh, it contains a design to actually enclose the system from the boot, so from the secure boot, from the DRM sort of uh, layer, the digital restriction management, to the top application layer. And that's why they are, they are building this sort of uh, uh, interdependency. Now, if you understand that uh, if you say that uh, to communicate real-time events and notify events, you can only use the bus, and the bus is already only working with system D because it's part, it already uh, became part of system D, just like uh, you then, uh, uh, you are de facto establishing and trying to establish a dependency for, for uh, systems that are built for that. That's why communities, uh, popular underground communities like the Sutless community have completely revolted to this. It's exactly about uh, interdependency and minimalism in style. 